Do we desire your prayers today? soul it longs for you. My flesh faints for you in this land. This dry land where there is no dream. I've looked upon you in this place. Beholding your power and glory. Lord,
me and saved me from my enemy. The Son of God surrounds his saints. He will deliver them. He will deliver them. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Come and song his name.
I'm thirsty for you. Are you thirsty this morning? In a dry land with no drink, I need you. shouting out all these things and 
making himself as some prophet. People was blaspheming the Lord. Uh, there was some sort of gang or group that was over there in the corner from us, and he began to try to get violent with me through there. I had didn't have my suit on, didn't have no megaphone or no microphone. All I had in my hands was a book yeah. of the Word of God. Yeah. And in that dark place, it was as if though that I felt God's hand upon me yeah. in a way that I have never experienced before in my life. On, they began to say things to me, brother, that I didn't expect they would say. Yeah. But brother, I felt the love of God in me towards all those that cursed Him. They cursed me. And brother, I'll never forget in all the days of my life that man that came before me and said to stop speaking God's name. I said, I will not speak, not stop speaking the name of God upon my lips. Yeah. And as he began to walk before me, I stood where I stood. And brother, there was some force that launched that man back away from me. Yeah. And God gave me yeah. peace. And brother, it is the God of Israel that I trust yes. in to give me liberty to preach in this morning. Yeah. Brother, I don't need a microphone or I don't need a fancy pulpit. Yeah. If God's Spirit from heaven would fall upon yeah. me, brother, I will speak the truth yeah. of God as yeah. does, brother, that has been yeah. given the liberty of God to preach yeah. His Word. So whatever God would do with my lips this morning, I'd do it as a weak vessel. Brother, I remember whenever I was 13 years old and I left behind an old barn, I'd give my testimony when I was saved. And normally when I sat down, words began to come out of my mouth, brother, that I'd never spoke before in my life. Words from the Scriptures that I don't know for sure that I've ever read before began to spew out of my life. And eight children made professions for Christ. When I left behind that farm, everybody began to talk to me. It was as though that I couldn't hear them, the words that they were saying to me. I walked over to an old tree and the light of God shone upon my face. And I fell within the depths of my heart. Son, I've called you to preach my word. And brother, the same God, brother, that has blessed me on that very day is the same God that will allow me to accomplish the work that He's laid before me, brother. I don't want to preach once in my life without the power and demonstration of the Holy Ghost upon my lips. And I've taught you, dear children, in the past month of how important that it is of this book and the sacredness of God's Word and God revealing Christ through these Scriptures. How this book is inerrant with no errors. It is the perfect Word of God. It is a reflection of His very nature. And I've told you of the truth of God's Word and, and how important that it is to read the Holy Scriptures and what preaching truly is. It's not some sort of motivational speaking or some sort of practice orchestration of words. It is the power of God upon a man. I don't know where the light is coming from in this place, but I feel it upon me. I feel the power of God touching my body. I don't know where this radiant light is coming from. <laughs> but I feel that God has touched my lips to speak to you today. Would you please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3. Oh, if I speak no word, I've been in the presence of God this morning. Oh, but He would wrap His arms around me. Run his fingers through my hair and kiss my forehead and say, Son, I'll take care of you. Oh, to be in the arms of the one that loves me and cherishes me. For I am his bride and he's my groom and he's purchased me with his own blood. Oh, what a precious gift it is to be wed to the Lord. To be in a union with him. Oh, the glory of Christ far better than any preaching that I've ever experienced or any service that I've ever had in the night watches to be in the presence of God. Far better than it is to preach a sermon than it is to be in the presence of God. Far better than it is to sing a song than to try to open up your mouth and no words come out. To be in the presence of Christ in His Spirit. God, make me a weak man that the power of Christ may rest upon me and that these people today would not say no words of me but of the power of Christ. Thank you, Spirit. 
you to leave me alone today. Because to me, it's been real. 
I feel like God has dug a mud pit and through every single bit of the garbage in this life and has put Taylor Bentley right there in the bottom of it. Let take my eyes open and let me see how awful that this world really is. And my prayer for the past two months has been, God, take me out of the mud pit. Please. Why are you showing me what you're showing me? I believe it's that I may magnify His light to a greater degree. When I'm out of the darkness, perhaps I'll see the light in such a dark world. But I praise God for what he, whatever He... We're in seasons in this life. Whatever His purpose is for this darkness that I found myself in, His light is still with me and I'm still alive. It's not under a bush or a city that's set on a hill that cannot be hid. So He urges Timothy to continue the things which He's learned. Continue in them. Don't turn back. Don't give up on all His gloom and doom. Keep pressing on. It says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy... Scriptures. Now, I want to read, uh, Timothy was the son of a Greek father, and he was the son of a Jewish mother. So he had, when he was pretty much a grown man, Paul had to go and circumcise him that way that he could have an influence to the Jews. So he had a Greek father, and he had a Jewish mother, and this is what it says about Timothy. This is what, I'm glad to know that you can't just have a child like this unless there's a little bit of family supporting them. And this is what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in me. And that's a pretty good description. The unfeigned faith. Not somebody that's constantly on the fence, constantly for the Lord one day and, and out the world the next. He had an unfeigned faith. Now who's the credit for all this? Which dwelt first in my grandmother Lois. Ooh, Lois was a good grandmother, huh? Well, you know what she did? She didn't say, well, this was all for Lois. She had a daughter. It says, and thy mother Eunice. So he had a godly grandmother and a godly mother. Isn't that a precious thing to have? Because he had a godly grandmother and a godly mother that taught them the ways of the faith. This is what he said. He says, I remember the unfeigned faith and this is what he said. And I'm persuaded that in thee also your grandma had it. Your mommy had it. And I believe you've got it too. It's stay on the line. Raise your children in the way they should go. That they will not depart from. They might be living like a devil now. But brother, there's going to come a time they're going to remember what you taught them about God. They may be out smoking a pipe out living wild, but one of these days they're going to remember the gospel of Jesus Christ. So they're out living wild. Keep claiming the promise. I taught them, Lord. I taught them, Lord. I taught them, Lord. They will remember yeah. David want to steal my baby. Yeah. I believe God's promises remember what the devil said. Yeah. All them Bible studies, all that Sunday school, that ain't go to nothing. To have a purpose. Come on, brother. me. I had it. I went to Sunday school and everything else. I lived like a wild man, but I remember. It's true. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes. Right? Yes. 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 It may have just been a t-shirt when I was six or seven. I might have just got that Bible because I liked it was the color blue. But there would come a day, brother, to where I got it. Not because my mommy gave it to me or my grandmommy. They may have had it, but God gave it to me. Yeah. God's yeah. 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 That's the best thing you can say about a child. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scripture. And listen, I'm in the learning stage. I'm a leader pastor, but I'm in the learning stage of being a dad and being a husband. And I'm learning for the first time how important that it is. Before I disciple you, disciple my children. You say, when do you start? At the very minute they say, when? <laughs> I, I preach to them. I preach to them. I asked my daughter the other day, I said, how, how do I get saved? She said, repent, believe in Jesus. I said, amen. Yeah. Yeah. She went through Walmart one day, she said, get saved! <laughs> I said, well, I feel like I messed up all the time. But if they're not there, they're still there. Then God must be put something right. <laughs> or either that, I'm trusting you to do it. <laughs> yeah. A little rest of your time's coming too. <laughs> yeah. They might not be able to speak, but they can listen. Amen. Yeah. 
Holy Spirit given formula for salvation. Wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. No comma. All the way through that order. Wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. <coughs> he that comes to God must come to Him by what? Faith. Because without what? It's impossible to please God. Without faith it's impossible to please God. So you have to have faith. Now faith and God's Word are connected. Now this is where I believe that the modern evangelism and modern gospel is truly messed up. It's because we're telling people to believe in Jesus, but we're not doing it from this. We're telling, to, we're telling people to believe in Christ, but not from this. Not from this. So if they respond to whatever they're given, is it faith or no? Because Romans 10, 17 says... You know, you have that, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, all this about belief, but this is the verse we skip over all the time in verse 17. So that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Amen. So you have to have faith to get to salvation, and you can't have faith without the hearing of the Word of God. Now I'm trying to be simple today. I'm not trying to impress nobody today. I'm trying to work with what I can come up with. I'm trying to be plain. Without the hearing of the Word of God, you cannot exercise faith in God. But now faith in what? Faith in what? Now, Kayla and I have been reading a book called Pilgrim's Promise. I don't know if we ever just started it. And it's about this man named Christian. He goes to all these places to try to arrive in that narrow gate, which leads to life. And he's going all these places. And one of the places that he goes to is a big mountain and earthly wisdom tells him to go there. And it's Mount Sinai. Now what this earthly man of wisdom told Christian to do was to go to the mountain and do good things so you can enter into the mountain. Now is that the way to get to heaven? Boys, if we had to do that, I'd give up and be done. If we had to present our good works before the Lord, then none of us would be on. So he tries to go there, and then evangelist says, Where in the world are you going? Because if you go up that mountain, it's going to fall down on your face. Some of you, instead of going to Mount Calvary, are trying to go through Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is the law which no man can keep. Mount Calvary is of grace. And God told us that if you even touch the mountain, you're dead. You can't go through good works. So what's your faith in? Self, self, self. Which is in Christ Jesus. <coughs> now, the Holy Scriptures magnify Christ Jesus. This book is not to boast of Moses. This book is not to boast of Elijah. And this book is not to boast of yourself. This book, from the front to the back, is to reveal one person. That is Jesus Christ. This book magnifies Jesus Christ. And if Jesus Christ is not being magnified, they're either misinterpreting the book or they're reading from some other book. This book magnifies Christ Jesus. And that don't mean everybody's going to be convulsing in the floor and running around and doing laps and everything like that. I don't know. But whatever happens, it magnifies Christ Jesus always. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. If the response, if the reaction is it glorify Christ, it's not from this book. It's from some other spirit. That's what the Bible says. Test the spirits to see whether they are of God or not. Not everybody that names the name of Christ knows Him and loves Him and serves yeah, Him. Yeah, yeah. Amen? Yeah. We think everybody's a sheep. No, some of them they look like sheep, but they got sheep skin on them. They're yeah. just wolves. Yeah. <laughs> everybody thinking everybody's saved. No, no, no everybody's not. We looked at this Wednesday in John chapter 6. There's a big crowd around Jesus. And Jesus says, I know who believes and I know who doesn't. And when He said that, the Bible says that there was a big multitude that went back and they never followed Him anymore. Jesus knows who believes. Who believes. So, the Holy Scriptures magnify Jesus. And this is a big phrase in the New Testament. It starts to just blow up all the way through. The Word, the Word, the Word, the Word. But it's capital W! What's this? The Word. Now, 
John chapter 1, and we've read it multiple times. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. So, John's first chapters, if you look in John 1 and 1 John 1, his purpose is to correctly identify who the Word is. That's his purpose. The first chapter of John and the first chapter of 1 John is to correctly identify the Word. He doesn't give any scripture, he doesn't give anything until he identifies who the Word is in both books. You know, look, actually, we're going to. Here we go. In the beginning was the capital W Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And how important is the Word? Well, you wouldn't be here with that. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So the Word made all things. And without the Word, there is no thing. So 1 John chapter 1, verse 3 is the Trinitarian doctrine of the Word. The Trinitarian doctrine, the doctrine of the Trinity in the Word. And John is obsessed with this. He makes sure, he makes clear that Jesus is not just of the seed of David. He's not just some mortal man. He's not just some prophet. He's not just some teacher. This is what it says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. So of the one, which is God, the Word... The Word, in John chapter 1, verse 14, he says something about the Word. The one that made the world, the one that breathed into man's nostrils, this man, it says, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, and the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now this is what First John actually says about the Word. So in John chapter 1, he says the Word was with the Father, the Word became flesh. And then in 1 John, he talks about what they did with the Word, what their relationship was with the Word. It says in 1 John chapter 1, that which was made from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the Word of life, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and shew unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. He said, you know, that word that by him all things exist when the word was made flesh we handled with our hands what does that mean it means that he walked upon the earth it means they ate bread together it means that they beheld him and touched him he was the feet the word god emmanuel they touched him they felt him they heard him they seen him he was there amen amen we touched the word we sing the Word. We handle the Word of life. Who is Jesus? He is the image of the invisible God. Because no man has seen God at any time. That is what it says. And we beheld His glory. We beheld His glory. He may have seen God when they seen Christ. Now, the most phenomenal sermon, the most phenomenal sermon that was ever preached was the two men. One of another name of another one we don't. Please. And somebody else on an amazed road. The greatest sermon ever preached was in the Word Say it one more time. The greatest sermon ever preached was in the Word. Was from the Word. Was by the Word. The man from Galilee, the Word. 
preached the greatest sermon ever preached to two men. And listen to this. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, He expounded unto them in the Scriptures the things concerning Him, Himself. Now, I expound the Scriptures, all things concerning Him, concerning Him, concerning Him. Stop looking at me. Him, Him, Him. But when Jesus unquoted the Scriptures, He expounded the things concerning Himself. So Jesus said, here, let me show you. I'm going to show you in every single place in the Bible where I am. But the thing is, I'm like, God, why did you tell him to put it in there? I want to love it. We didn't see the manuscript. We have the overview. We didn't see the inner parts of it. I guess it was just for those two. But now, I think that it may have went a little something like this. In the beginning, God created the field. The Bible says that He separated the light from the darkness. The greater light to rule the day and the less light to rule the night. And then the Bible says that He said, let us. There's the Father. There's the Word. There's the Holy Ghost. Let us create man and our own image and in our likeness. And then the Bible said, I can imagine Jesus saying, here I love this part right here. Because you wouldn't be here without it. The Bible says that He made man in the dust of the ground. And He breathed into His nostrils to bring the love. And man would kind of lift his soul. And then He said, well, it's not good that man should be alone. He said, I'll make him a help in you. He said, I'll put asleep in the morning. Hey, God can light you on fire. Or He can put you asleep. Take your pick. But the Bible says a great sleep fell on him. And the Bible says that he opened up the ribs, took one of them out, and formed one. And then the Bible says, I said, This is bone of my bone, and flesh of my flesh. And Jesus said, No, you know how it is written that man shall leave his father and put a plea unto his wife. And they know shall be no longer twain, but one flesh. But the Apostle Paul said, This is a great mystery. I've been serving Christ and the Church. Hey, you people talk about marriage. Put two men and two women in it. You better be careful of what you put your hands on. And that's to show this world our Christ union with His church. I think it might have went a little something like this. He said, but maybe time fell. And I didn't do that. It says, and I will put enmity. Y'all pray for me. I'm getting dry. If I lose my balls, it'll be alright. When I lose it, and then I'll quit. I don't need it. No how. God don't give it to me. And the Bible says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And God looks at that old serpent and says, hey, you think you one big boy. I'll have the seed of that woman. I bet you to see I'm going to raise up one. And this will bruise his heel. But he's going to stomp and bruise on your little head. And then the Bible says, in verse 21, now he told Adam and Eve, this is what he said, he said, the day you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now he said, the day you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. And brother, they should have dropped dead right then. But the Bible says in verse 21, unto Adam also and to his wife, did the Lord make coats of skins and clothe them. They were in their nakedness. They were in their shame. They were in their sin. They looked like that. They looked like sin. But God killed an animal and clothed them. Because what does it tell us? And instead of letting Adam and Eve die, He clothed them and sent them out from where His presence was. God started teaching them that sin requires some sort of sacrifice. God shedding blood to cover His people and their nakedness. Genesis chapter 6 of a man named, a man whose name is Noah. Yeah. He was a faithful man. In the New Testament it says he's a preacher of righteousness. 
And listen, Noah was living in a world just like we live in today. And Jesus says that in the last days, so shall it be as it was in the days of Noah. And then in Noah's day, the world was filled up with violence, even their imaginations was weak. All this pornography and all this TV and all this wicked stuff, and this I'll call it what it is. It's of the devil. It ain't of God. Let your children watch things, and I just say what it is. All these networks that we've loved and beheld, showing people two men and two women, and teaching them dishonoring Christ. But we shouldn't show your children things like that. God, but I'm glad there's going to come a day I won't have to drink no bottle of water like this. I'm going to drink to the fountain. Let me ever run dry. Listen, friends. I have a God. But the Bible says that it says, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And listen, now God is so right. And so people say all the time, If God's so good, why does he let all this evil stuff happen? And my friend, that's the wrong question. And God is so holy and so good. Why the world would be even full of making an ark for a man and his family? Why would he just let the world burn up? Because God is rich in mercy and compassion, brother. And it says, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shut up, make him an ark, and shall pitch it within without the pit. And listen, my friend, this is what happened. While the whole world was going underwater, I'm sure they all laughed and scoffed at Noah and all his message. But whenever they were underneath the water, they seen an ark of wood floating above the judgment of God, and God had his hand upon them. Yeah. God took wood. He put a family in there and he kept them safe through his judgment. And brother, I think it may have went a little bit something like this. In Genesis chapter 22, Abraham has begun to know the goodness of God and finally he's had him a son. He circumcised him on the eighth day as God told him to do. He was obeying God. The Bible says that in the night that God began to deal with him and say, Abraham, I want you to take that son, not only son of that lotus, and I want you to give him to me. I want you to make a sacrifice with him and give him to me. And the Bible says he rose up early. He took a couple men and he saddled up his ass and he took his son and took up the old hood upon the mountain. And the Bible says, uh, he said, Father, and this is what it says here in Genesis chapter 22, verse 8. Uh, his son said, uh, uh, Father, he said, uh, uh, I, I see the fire in the wood. He said, but, but, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. The father was obedient, and so was the son. Isaac wasn't saying, Daddy, get away from me. Get away from me. He said, Here I am, Father. But Isaac did what the father said, and uh, Abraham and Isaac both were doing the same work. And the Bible says that Abraham, he took back his hand with that knife. Some say he was just waiting. My friend, he wasn't waiting. I believe he would have took down that knife. Because Hebrew says he believed that if he did kill him, that God could even raise him from the dead. And who's he talking about there? I just have to move on. But the Bible says that he raised his hand. And listen, the Bible says that God called out and he said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here, man. I'll go into the scripture and read about all these men. Abraham, Abraham, Samuel, Samuel. And then say, hey, say, be here by you one. His son's name on the altar. And the Bible said, and Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold him, a ram caught in the thick of his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord. It shall be seen. As it was said once before, that God took the hand out of Abraham's knife and laid out his own son in the stead. Because Abraham was obedient, says, And in my seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Well, then was Jesus fashioned according to the seed of David, who was, a, who was of the seed of Abraham. God was saying, Of the seed, what did he say? Of the seed of the woman, and the seed of Abraham, of the seed of David, the Messiah is going to come forth and save his people. I believe the man would say like this. Oh, yeah, and you heard about Moses, didn't you? Jesus knew what his name You know what Abe says, right? Remember the place? Well, you remember that Passover night? 
Remember how I told Moses and Aaron said, I'm going to sweep through there and I'm going to kill the firstborn of all the men of all the beasts? Do you remember that? He said, take a lamb for the count of the household. Kill it. Shed its blood on the doorpost. You know what was coming upon Egypt that night? The full judgment of God. The judgment of God was coming upon that place. And he said, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. You know why God does what He does? All the things that He does is so one phrase can be given to all of mankind. I am the Lord. Not Pharaoh, but through God's I am the Lord, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And all of Israel, they would have this big festival in which they would take of the unleavened bread and of the wine and celebrate the night to where God delivered them from the hand of God's judgment that their house may be saved. All through the generations of Israel, God showed them that I will, what did Abraham tell Isaac? Don't look for a lamb. Don't worry where a lamb's going to come from. God will provide for himself a lamb. And Isaiah chapter 9, it begins to speak about, and his name shall be. The government shall be on his shoulders, his name shall be wonderful counsel of the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the coming of Messiah. And in verse 1, it talks about a place that God allowed all this judgment to happen to. They caught it the shadow of death, they caught it this dark land. And Jesus one day began to walk in their borders. And Isaiah, about 800 years beforehand, said, The people that walked in darkness, have seen a great light. They dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them. Have the light shine. And that's the picture of the whole world when Messiah came. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death. The Bible says, Hebrews, and it is important that the man wants to die. But after this, the judgment. And then the shadow of death it says upon them hath the light shine. And he told him, he said, I am the light of the world. And after Jesus had went through and showed them Moses and all the prophets and things concerning himself, they got together and they beheld the word. Their eyes were closed at this point. And they were he was taking bread with him and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to him. This is what verses 31 and 32 says. And their eyes were open. You know, that at the moment when a person is born again, they begin to see the truth of God. It's just like all of a sudden, do you remember when you opened up your eyes for the first time? It was like, boom. What is all this? And the light just began to. And their eyes were open and they knew him. Because Jesus showed them from the scripture who he is, and their eyes were open. They said, That's him right there. That's him. And you know when their eyes was open, the very second Jesus came out of the eyes. And you can never be saved until Jesus does that for you. And he vanished out of their sight. I'm glad we never the reversal that's going to happen that he comes into my side. Yeah. And this is what they say, and I don't know, I ain't going to play on nobody's emotions here today. I don't know who's experiencing what they're experiencing right here. I don't know who you look like, who you are. I don't know anybody that says they know liars only God searches the hearts of men. But this verse right here. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while He talked with us by the way and while He opened to us the Scriptures? Faith came by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. When a person is saved, well, this Word is preached by the grace of God to sinners. And their eyes are open. You'll burn at the very thought of the sight. You won't harden your heart and say, I don't need it, I'm good enough, I don't need Christ. Your heart will burn at the very thought of His holiness and glory. And this is the verse that's going to do another one. I feel like I need to end with this one. John chapter 12. And this is a very misinterpreted passage, and I need to correct it today because I believe it may lead to the salvation of some of the soul here. 
I tried so hard. God, I gotta make it sound a certain way. I gotta simply this. Jesus died for your sins, was buried, rose again the third day. That's it right there. And if it's not enough to save you, then you can't be saved. I have no question in my mind that I'm in the Spirit's building at this moment. I'm not going to have nobody come to this piano today. I'm not going to have nobody sing. I'm not going to do... I'm not going to do the altar call this morning. I'm not going to have nobody sing. Can I tell you something that God has been revealing to your pastor? Will you listen to me? Please listen to me. Listen to me. God does not need our tricks or our fancy footwork to save sinners. God doesn't need our handbook. And God doesn't need me to save sinners. God doesn't need what we can do to draw you in. What did He say? I will draw all men unto me. I can pull and pull and beg and beg and plead and plead and drag and drag and drag it all out. I can stand up here all day and with my own flesh I can probably make every person under this roof cry. What good is a bit of garbage like that? I believe that God does not need man for man to be saved. I believe that man needs God that man may be saved. I'm not saying we ain't never going to do an altar call again. That's what I'm saying. But I'm saying you need to know. And I don't know who I'm talking to today. But there is nothing that I can do to save you. There's nothing that I can do to make you come. Some people say, make them stand so they get a step closer. I believe that this building was under ashes and we were all under the, the wood of this building laid down on our floor and God wanted to save someone. They came up out of the ashes and gave them up to Christ. Can I tell you something? <laughs> you don't know the reason why that I had you all stop. And this, this is from my heart. I'm pouring out my heart to you right now. I probably go home and go to sleep and I'll wake up for three days after that. <laughs> I'm pouring out my heart to you today. You know the reason why I had you stop bouncing your heads and raising your hand? You know the reason why I had you stop doing that? It's because I stayed up all night and wept with this morning, Bruce. Say it. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Oh God, what have I done? God, you can't remember the time to take your hands off of the stones that I want to say. Take your hands off of my mindedness. Say, Jonah. I'm not saying you got to understand. 
Trinitarian doctrine and theology and all these things. You don't have to understand none of those. You have to understand this. That Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried, rose again the third day. And you have to repent, forsake those sins, turn from them, and place your faith alone in Jesus Christ. I'm standing here right now, in this moment, with no power. I see so many souls before me. And you know what my flesh wants to do? Start twisting, start turning. My hands is off right now. If God is drawing somebody and they need to come cry out to God, I'm willing in this moment right now to pray with you. I'll pray for you. I'm going to pray with you. Is there anybody today that needs Christ? Has anybody's eyes been opened? And if that's the case, willing to cry out to God. God, for your glory. Speak to the hearts of men. We're building for people that cannot even save themselves. They can't even feed themselves, God, without your power. You say, I believe. The scripture says you have to confess. You have to confess it. Before me. Wherever the conviction of God is. And this I'm talking about examining yourself. Because I'm drawn to a close. Don't say, preacher, I done did that years ago. I done did that prayer. I done did that. If you don't have fellowship with God and your life's not changed, my friend, you need to examine it. And make sure. Wherever the conviction of God, whether it's in this building, whether it's whenever you walk in that parking lot. Okay. Lord, I'll tell you a story. That's it. This is a nice little quick story. One time Charles Spurgeon. One time Charles Spurgeon was inside of the, uh, uh, the big Coliseum. People were coming there to hear it. There was that fancy about anything. It was coming here to the priest and worship and pray. And they were getting in this building to see if everybody could hear his voice. So he goes up in there. He stands up. He said, I'm just going to test and see how far my voice can carry. He said, Behold the Lamb! God. He thought it was empty. There's a man on the roof. They realized. Charles Burton was walking through. He said, Just some mysterious man runs out and falls before him. And he says, Sir, I've heard the voice of God. He said, Well, what did God say? He said, I was on the roof and I heard the voice of God. He said, well, what did God say? He said, behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. He said, that was God. <laughs> he said, he fell down on his face, gave his life to Christ right there. God doesn't need any of our tricks, children. Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. And if God has revealed that to you, let Him take away your sin. For He is the worthy Lamb.